leadership, Webster worked to reform the way the legislature did business, requiring all proposed laws to meet the specific criteria that would determine their effectiveness in benefiting the people of the United States of America. As the first non-lawyer, I'm kind of proud to, to say that, that's kind of, kind of neat, he chaired the Senate Judiciary Committee of Florida. Then Webster said Florida is the only state to pass the constitutional amendment protecting its citizens' property rights in the aftermath of the landmark, is it Kelo? The Kelo case in 2005. And that dealt with the property rights of government ability to seize those properties. With his engineering background, Webster found transportation issues quite interesting, and he was thrilled to serve as a ranking member of the Transportation Committee in the Florida House, representing Central Florida's unique transportation needs. Currently, Dan Webster is working in Congress on transportation issues to create jobs, improve Florida roads and highways, and find ways to save money by eliminating fraud and abuse. Good luck there. <laughs> Webster's other committee assignments in Congress is on the Influential House Rules Committee, where he's fighting to bring more transparency to the process and advance a policy environment based on freedom. I give you Dan Webster. Thank you, Roger. It's a pleasure to be here to speak with you this morning. Uh, it's, a, it's a great morning, it is, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, happy to be here. What I would like to talk to you about first is something that we, we do as a uh, congressional office. Uh, maybe unlike others, we are very aggressive in soliciting um, constituents who have a problem with the $3.6 trillion business known as the federal government. And so you may be a person who's called up the, the federal government and you got right through and you got your answer to the whatever it was. I'm sure you weren't put on hold when you called IRS. They just took your call and answered your question. But some people can't get through, and uh, that's what we're here to tell you about. And that is, uh, we can be your liaison. We have uh, people that uh, are appointed to help uh, the Congress work, to help people work their way through the bureaucracy. So we have a list, we have this little brochure about constituent services, has our four, four offices. We have one in Tavares, one down in Claremont, one in Winter Garden, one in Winter Haven. And uh, the whole purpose is to, to take uh, whatever problem you might have from the IRS, the task force, the VA, and we can help you get an answer. Uh, I'm going to give you two examples so you know what it means. You may not need this today, but you may need it tomorrow. And you may not need it to a friend of yours. You are all leaders, and I appreciate the Chamber of Commerce, and I appreciate the work you do here in this community because it's awesome and it's needed. And every one of you are asked questions by people just because you're a leader in this community. And so you can point them in the right direction. There was a couple that was headed to, uh, out of the country. They were going to Miami to catch a flight in, um, at Miami International Airport. And they were on their way down 995, and they were checking their passports. Everything was fine. And then they happened to notice that their child's passport did not last as long as adult passports. Children's passports last five years, <clears throat> and adults ten. So they were past the five years, and they're getting ready to leave that night. So they called their office on the road and said, could you intervene and get us an appointment with the Miami uh, passport office? So we did that. But then they called back and said, hey, we're stuck in traffic, and we're not going to make it. And this is the federal government, and they close at 4 o'clock. And there, that means somebody is standing at the door at 3.59 to turn the lock. That's the way it works. So we called them up, had them on the phone from that time forward, begging them to stay open. They said they would. Then when they got to Miami, it was the day that the Miami Heat was celebrating their championship, <laughs> and all the roads were blocked. And it was a mess. And so we had to... We had to tell them they're going to be a little bit later. Can you stay? And they stayed and they let them in. It wasn't the front door, they let them in the back door. And then when they got inside, they needed a picture. So we just said, just let them go down to CBS. They can do it. And they can go down there, they can get the picture, get the, get the passport. Okay, so they did all that and they got the passport and they headed out, out of the country. And I don't know, you know. They may have been able to do that on their own, but I don't think they could have. I don't. Um, here's another couple who did need our help. 
We don't do 1040 tax reform. We don't give legal advice, but we can intervene and get the IRS to look at something again. So here's a couple. They had uh, made a deduction. The IRS disagreed with that deduction. They paid the tax, but then they started looking at it again and, and really felt strongly that they were right. So they called our office and asked, could we get them an appointment and, and, and have them explain it to the IRS? So we called them and they said, okay, they would meet with them. They met with them. They looked at it. They absolutely agreed that they had made a mistake. They were IRS was wrong, and they sent them a check for forty thousand dollars. Now, I can't do that every time. <laughs> so, so, but it is a time, and they need to help. And there are hundreds and hundreds of cases like that. And all I can tell you is, we'll do the best we can to get you an answer. Just others. There was a, another lady who had asked a question eight months prior. All she wanted by that time, she wanted it to be yes initially, but at, by eight months, she was just wanting yes or no, tell me what the answer is. And uh, we ended up getting her answer, and it was a positive answer, but still, she was happy. She would have been happy with no, she just wanted an answer. Somebody tell me what the answer is. And so, there's that. Um, the last thing that, I, I'd like to say one little thing about, the last thing Roger said <clears throat> was, I, I have done my best to explain uh, or to talk about the fact that there is in government two things, but they're, they're mutually exclusive. One is power, and that's kind of the default. And the other is principle. They cannot coexist. And I really wasn't going to talk about that, but I wanted to at least say something about it because it is very, very important. And it doesn't matter whether it's a church group or a chamber of commerce or, or, or the United States Congress or the state legislatures that the representative met serves in it, uh, or any other place. Power and principle uh, cannot coexist. They exclude, uh, one excludes the other. The default, if you did nothing, the default is power. What is power? Well, it means that there's this pyramid in every organization. And at the top of that pyramid are a few people. And if you, if you have a, a, uh, an organization, and it could be the Congress, like I said, that's based on power, then only a few people at the top know what's going on. And I, I, I explained to a group of young people the other day that I lived in a state legislature uh, for 28 years. And during part of that time, it was a power-based system. The power was higher than the space deal. And there were a few people at the top who made all the decisions. And uh, I really didn't come to talk about that today, but I'm going to say one little thing about it. Here's the way it always worked. When session, during the legislative session, two months later, uh, almost every bill was delayed until the end. They would stick all the bills into appropriations committee. And then there would be this, what they call the pocket calendar. At the end, the, uh, the rules chairman would pull out of his pocket the next bill, so no one would be prepared to do any amendments or anything. Well, fast forward to the last day, I just want to tell you about the last day of session, the way it used to work. Last day of session, and this happened every single year. When I was in the minority, I was in there 16 years in the minority. Uh, it happened this way every single time. Uh, the last day would start at 8 o'clock in the morning, and we would work till noon, and they had lunch in the back. Every, every year, we had pizza. Every year. I'm going to tell you why that might not be the best thing to have, but, it, but we had pizza. It's not that it wasn't good, it was great pizza. Then we would work till 6 o'clock. Now, the calendar had 150 bills on it. So, so there was, you, you just work and, and work and work and work all day long. So uh, you were voting the whole time, no breaks really. So you get to 6 o'clock and they had dinner in the back. Every year, it was either meatloaf or barbecue. <laughs> Now understand that all of this was done because of power. It was. So then we would work until midnight. 
And after midnight, every year, is when the big issues would come out. And by then, think about what you'd, you'd be like, just your body. You'd eat pizza, barbecue or meatloaf, and you'd worked all day long. And now you're going to vote on the biggest issues of session. That's the way it worked. That's the way a power system worked that way. So the, the members of the, of, the, uh, of the few that knew what was going on would slip all these things into bills. So there's this big bill. No one even wanted to ask a question by that time. They did. And nobody did. So I had, a <coughs> I had, it on my, had a little thing on my desk just said, when in doubt, vote no. <laughs> it was a safe, safe principle. And so anyway, so we, we would have these uh, discussions and, and we'd think, oh, wow, I, did, I don't even want to be voting on these big things. So just for instance, one, one session right before I became Speaker of the House, uh, when things changed a little bit, but we, we after midnight, voted on, in about a 20-minute period of time, the budget, uh, we dismantled the Department of Commerce, created a new Department of Health, and rewrote all the welfare laws in the state of Florida in 20 minutes wow. on bills that were hundreds of pages long. So here's what would happen. Then you leave. I used to call it the exponential train wreck, but it really wasn't a train wreck. It was all planned so that there could be things in those bills that nobody knew about. So then you would leave that could never pass in the light of day. So you leave session, and what happens? Well, here's what happens. Six months later, maybe just six weeks, sometimes six hours later, you find out what was in those bills you just voted on. One year, there was scholarships for prisoners stuck in there by these few people at the top. And there were taxes and fees and other things, regular, nothing that would have passed in the light of day. But they used this power-based system to do it. And so, all I can tell you is, uh, when, look for the principles, because a, uh, th that's why when I go, I, I, I was at the Rotary Club yesterday, or day before, day before yesterday. You know, they have a set of four principles. There's nothing wrong, those are great principles. But you know what? If power is in the room, those principles mean nothing. But if power is pushed aside, then principles are everything. And all I can tell you is, look for the principles, because that is the root cause of the problems in the United States Congress <coughs> and any other government entity that bases everything on power. The, the root cause is the fact we're not focusing on principles. And the reason we can't gather together is because we don't have principles. We, we talk about these individual issues, but if we had a discussion on the basic principles of what makes this country great, things would be a lot better. They would. And if we had a Congress and a legislature and even, even groups and organizations, if they based everything on principle, then power would be pushed aside and everybody would be working for the common good. So <coughs> I'm going to give you uh, something about the culture uh, in, in Washington, D.C. And I want to tell you why this is not very good. Here's, and this is what I'm, I would fight against. And it's, it's the idea that, here's the idea. If it's appropriated, spend it. I want you to think about those words. If it's appropriated, spend it. That's the way Washington works. And there's a lot of other groups that work the same way. So that means is there's no incentive. I mean, there was just mention of fraud, waste, and abuse. Everybody talk, er, you ever heard those three words used in, in together? Fraud, waste, and abuse? A lot of people talk about it. If we could just get rid of fraud, waste, and abuse, I want to talk to you only about one of those words. Fraud is a crime, and you can punish someone for that. Abuse is a crime, and you can punish someone for that. Waste is not a crime. It's not. Now, I could say it's criminal. <laughs> it is, that we get away with it. But waste is not a crime. Matter of fact, it is promoted. And the way you promote waste is that one <coughs> phrase, if it's appropriated, spend it. Which is sad. So I'm going to give you an example. I decided I wanted to at least, from my own personal standpoint, prove 
that you don't have to spend every dime that's appropriated. So we have money. I just told you about the four offices I have here. I have one in Washington. I have staff, a couple people here, uh, Garrett Pam, and uh, the people that do those constituent services that I talked about. And we hire all of those. And we buy, and they have computers and, and, and uh, phones and other things that they need to, to, to manage this district and to serve this district. There's a money, there is money appropriated for every member of Congress. And if you take that, what I just said, which is what's used by most members of Congress, if it's appropriated, spend it. So however much money you get, you just spend it. When you do that, you will waste money. You would. So I decided not to, not to make some effort, just to make sure that what I was spending wasn't wasteful. So after, after the end of this year, I will turn back over a million dollars. And it was just waste. It wasn't that we didn't serve any, everybody. It wasn't that we didn't hire people. It wasn't that we didn't have offices and, and availability. We had all that. It was just waste. So I'm going to give you one teeny little example that every single person, every business person in this room would have easily seen. So we're given these sheets of paper to check off when, we, when you first get elected. And so one of the, one of the sheets, or one of the, <coughs> the, the questions was, which computer service, they have four listed computer services that you can check off as that's the one you want. They're on the approved list. And if you check one, then you get your computer service for free. I use that word loosely, free. However, the lowest cost service of those four was $1,288 per month. I have 15 computers for 15 staff people. They're just regular computers. There's nothing souped up about them or anything. We don't do anything other than emails and constituent work and, and responding to, to, to letters that are written to us. That's, that's pretty much it. So it's not anything special. Some are used, some are newer. And it was going to cost, 12, well, over the two years, that was going to be over $32,000. Do you know how many computers you could buy for $32,000? It's crazy. So this is how it works, though. you got to understand when power is, is in force and you, you spend what's appropriated, then here's the way it works. If you don't check a box, they just... <gasps> he didn't check the box. So I didn't check the box. I didn't check any any of the four. And they say you forgot to check the box. I sent the form back to me. I didn't mean I meant not to check the box. I don't want you don't want to have your computer service for free, not at that price. No. So here's what I did. There's another list, and it's a list of where you buy things and where what you can buy. Uh, and so it's uh, all approved. So I had uh, matter of fact, Garrett's here. He uh, had him buy a couple of extra computers, two extra computers, $850 each. And so now I have 17 computers for 15 people. And at one break, by the way, that computer has a two-year on-site warning. So I don't need the service. So the point is, for $1,700, I, I can save the 30, I don't have to spend the $32,000. And if there's a problem, you just have an extra computer. And it's done. I guarantee everybody here would have seen that. So when the sequestration happened, part of the money was cut out of the House budget, and members of Congress felt that too. Um, well, I didn't spend all my money, so I had plenty. I didn't, it didn't bother me one bit. But other members, it was they, it's, they were affected by it. And so they said, hey, how do you, how do you save all that money? So I gave them this one. And they said, you mean, I said, did you check a box? Yeah, we checked a box. I said, you don't have, you don't have to check, you mean we don't have to check a box? I go, you're a member of the United States Congress, you don't have to check any box. <laughs> so, so do the multiplication. There's, there's, you say, well, that's, that's a, just a little bit, $32,000, $30,000. But then we, we deal in 10 year framework, so you multiply by 10, then you multiply by 435 members of Congress. Then you multiply it by senators have way more computers than we do. That's a hundred. But it's not just that. There are hundreds of thousands of computers owned by the federal government, and every one of them are covered by a free service. 
It's billions of dollars. It's not fraud. It's not abuse. It's just waste. And that's just one little thing, because that doesn't make up the full million dollars that, 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 we're gonna turn, that we've been, been able to turn back over time the last three years. It doesn't make that up. No, there are other things just like that. So uh, the principle, though, that I want you to think about is the fact that you don't have to spend just because it's appropriated. And we're looking for ways to incentivize that. So I shared that with the with the chairman of the House Administration Committee. And she goes, do you have any other ideas? I go, yeah, you got too many people working here. How do you know? I go, well, let me tell you a story. So I'll tell you this story. This is what, there was a, I had a knickknack shelf on one of the walls in the offices that I was given when I got to Washington. And I didn't need it because I didn't have anything to put on it. So I asked, could I take it down? Oh no, no, you can't take it down. We have to take it down for you. Okay. There's four fasteners that they had to take loose, but the shelf take her down her crew <laughs> <laughs> took, it, took it down. Now there's four little holes in the wall. So I'm thinking, okay, I'll get some spackling and put over. No, you can't do that. We'll send by the people to do that. Two people two people to come by and these four little dots they're going to spack them. Do y'all think? No. No, that's another group. <laughs> but we'll come back and sand it before they clean it. Okay. So they came back and sanded it all off. Then about five days later the painter shows up and they paint it. Took, took three weeks to take down that shelf. And a crew of people. That's, and I, so I said, you have too many employees. And I said, you know why you have all those employees? No. Because if it's appropriated, spend it. That's why. Why do the members check the box? Because if it's appropriated, spend it. Well, here's, here's my last story about this. I just want you to walk away with one thing, and that is, first of all, Principle and power can't coexist. And please don't fall into the trap of believing just because it's appropriated it needs to be spent. There was a light bulb out in my office. I called up and asked, could you get, could you send, could I come by and pick up a light bulb from the supply place? No, you can't. We have to have somebody do that. I go, um, well, I'm, I'm a graduate engineer from Georgia Tech <laughs> in electrical engineering. I, can, I promise you I can do it. So they send by a handyman? Absolutely not. They send by an electrician with a, with a voltmeter strapped on them and a whole toolcase and everything. And there's nothing wrong with me. I love electricians. But it's a light bulb. So I decided I'm going to watch, so I'll make sure that this is, you know, just a regular light bulb. <laughs> Are you sure it's out? I said, I'm positive it's out. <laughs> I didn't know. I'm not going to go into that. I just know it's out. <laughs> I screws it, puts the other one in, comes on, <coughs> and away it goes. If it's appropriated, spend it. It's not a good way to run government. It's not. So I'm doing what I can to not only encourage other members to follow some of the things I just talked about, and many more, and I'm trying to get the House administration to understand they have too many employees. But I'm also working on a way we can incentivize saving money. Because right now, you're encouraged to spend it if it's appropriate. And if you don't, you don't get, you don't get that much next year. So you have to spend it. Well, I say, if they save fifty percent, then they—I mean, if they save uh, like a hundred dollars, then they can keep fifty of it. As far as I'm, and you can use it for anything you want. I don't care. But give us back the other fifty. That's—that's that's what I believe we got to do. So, I only say that to say this: there are other things uh, that are issue-oriented that are wrong and things I'd like to fix. There are things that are right I'd like to do. 
sometimes it's just difficult to get Congress moving. I do have a, a bipartisan dinner that I host, and I won't go into a big deal about it other than the fact that it began with somebody who's on the other side, someone I've known a long time, who uh, answered my call. When I got to Washington, I called up uh, three Democrat members, and, and, to, and I figured the first one to call me back, I'm going to ask them to sit with me during the State of the Union. Okay, so I, <clears throat> I, uh, the first one called back was Debbie Wasserman Schultz. She's the chairman of the Democrat National Committee and a member of Congress. Okay, Debbie, you want to sit with it? Yes, so she did. And we decided to start a, a group, a bipartisan group, for dinner. So I invited four, and she invited four, for our first dinner. That would be ten total. And the people I invited, one of them said, I don't even want to be in the same room with her. I said, well, they feel the same way about you. <laughs> so just come. That person came. And the thing we did was just go around the room and let everybody tell their little story about how they got to Congress, who they were, where they're from, all that kind of thing. And, and, and the neat thing was, uh, one person was talking, and there were nine others listening, which doesn't happen much in Washington. You ever watch C-SPAN? I hope you don't. It's boring. <laughs> but, but, but if you it do, you're going to notice there's an empty room. There's talk. We like to talk. We like microphones. If there's nobody there listening, we'll still talk. <laughs> well, this was listening more than talking. And, and the great thing about it was um, everyone, including the fellow that didn't want to be there, said it was the best dinner he'd ever been to. It's only because a group of people listened to him. So we decided now the price to get in, this group of 10, the price to get in to the dinner from then on would be you have to bring someone from the other party. And so we've had six or seven, and we'll have another one before the end of the year. Uh, and they grow because everybody keeps bringing more. And I just think that somehow, some way, you got to figure out how we at least talk to each other. And we're working on that. We are. And it's, it's working. We've even, just the last couple, we've brought up issues. It's combative. It is, because we have some people on both ends of the spectrum, and so it's combative, but it's good, because at least we're talking about it. So that, that's kind of my report. And what I will tell you is this as far as me and my participation, um, I have this little voting card. Uh, I have a little pen I wear that gets me in the door, and they have this voting card, and I stick it in the back of one of the, uh, the along the rows, there's there's little card readers, so you stick it in, and you can push, uh, you know, the green or red button. Actually, Larry, uh, we have three buttons, <laughs> not two. I, when I was in the legislature, we had two, red and, and green. In, in Congress, you have the yellow button, which is present, it's a chicken. But it means you know, you're there, but you don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't use the chicken, but I use the green and red. So I use it to vote. And all I can admit to you is I know this card, even though it has my picture on it, my signature on it, it only is good until January 3rd, 2015. So another year and a half is good. After that, uh, so it's borrowed. After that, I have to re-earn it again. And I know that, and I realize that. But while I have it, I'm committing to you that I'm going to use it to the best of my ability to benefit this community. And that's what I'm going to do. And I may not always be right, but I'm going to give it the best I can. And I want you to know what's behind this vote. If I'm 51% for something, I'm going to vote for it. I know that sounds kind of funny, but that's how I'm elected. I'm elected with 50% plus one. And no bill is perfect, except, except the Mother's Day resolution or something like that. No bill is perfect. And if I'm 49% for it, I'm going to vote against it. Even if I'm almost there. If I'm not there and if it has more bad than good, I'm not going to vote for it. So just know that. I'm telling you that. But I, I also am committing to you. I'll use it to the best of my ability to help this community, help the state even. In some cases, some of the decisions we make affect the entire world. But I'm going to use it to benefit the people here. And 
And, and if I re-earn this card, then fine. If not, I'll stay home with my eight grandkids. Either way. But, but I'm going to do the best I can with the time I have to serve you uh, in this community by coming to these events and having our constituent service work as hard as we can. And then when I go to Washington, I want to serve you by voting the best way I can with the best information I have. I don't go to... <laughs> I don't go to dinners or receptions or anything like that. I go home and I read. There is so much to read. And I don't want to be caught blinded like they used to do in the Florida legislature by slipping in stuff. I want to know what's going on. I want to know what's in the bills. I want to know what's happening. And based on that, I'll make the best vote I possibly can given the information I have. So thank you for coming today. Thank you for listening. It's great to be here. Great to see all of you. Look forward to fellowshipping with you maybe afterwards. Good to see you all.